Bob, I'm a principal up here in the Walter Creek office, and we're going to try to talk to you about everything you need to know about construction defects or the SBA under process in 30 minutes or less. And that means we're going to do a very high level release because there's an infinite amount of crap about this, this subject that you probably want to sit through. First slide, it will be on our little packet in there, is what is a construction defect? Well, everybody that we've had these cases, they a lot of the managers are like, well, what is the defect, Andy? What is the thing we have an issue with? Well, I always like to tell them this, is that the defect is something that can't be maintained, right? So if you can maintain something, that's probably going to be a maintenance uh, manual. You're going to have some sort of an operating or maintenance budget for it, and it's going to be uh, able to maintain. If you can't maintain it, then that's the defect, right? Um, you guys all have been probably inundated over the years about the standards of residential construction and the SB, uh, the, 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 the um, civil section 896. So we don't, we're not going to go into that specifically. But uh, um, and the biggest thing is, is that the, if those defects are not identified and um, you're able to make a claim against the developer within the first 10 years of the development or the age of the property, it's going to be a, a, a pretty bad day when you have to special assess your members and have to go to repair them, and it's going to be painful by them. Hey, Andy, so, yeah. closer to the mic. That better? <laughs> well, with that, you got through that first slide without having to hear me. So <laughs> next slide with, uh, with Andrew Zimmerman. Do I need to cover your slide for you? <laughs> It wasn't that valuable anyway. So, so next, if you're following along, the next kind of portion of the statute, excuse me, of the construction defect, you've got your standards that Andy referenced. It's the statutes of limitation. All important because if you are one day past that statute of limitations, your client no longer has any basis, any standing, any legal right to make a claim. And the courts are not forgiving on this. Uh, got some managers here. It wasn't their fault. I'm not going to say their name. They were begging their clients you have a claim here, you have to make it, you have to make it, you have to make it. By the time the board finally came around, because the project was built in phases, we were able to bring construction defect claim on about 20% of the buildings. And so at the very best, they're going to have much less uh, in terms of compensation than they're going to need to make those repairs. The point being, you have to be within that statute of limitations. Now, everyone talks about the 10-year. That's kind of probably been drilled into you, and that's absolutely true when it comes to moisture intrusion, when it comes to structural issues, kind of the big ticket items, you have a 10 year statute of limitations. What people kind of forget about and don't talk about is within that, there are these interim statutes of limitation uh, that can be much less, any, anywhere from one to five years. Um, five years for paint, four years for plumbing and mechanical, electrical, those can be big ticket items. And so, you know, we, we meet people all the time and say, hey, we, we can wait till year six or seven. You really can't a lot of the time. Um, that's just the reality of it. Even, I can't tell you how many cases we get with kind of stacked condominium configurations where the first complaint is, oh my God, I can hear my neighbors, I can hear them eating cereal, I can hear them going to the bathroom. <laughs> Too bad, you have one year to bring that claim and, and it's over, it's long gone. So there's nothing to do about it. So it really does require vigilance on the part of the clients and management in kind of educating them in these processes. Um, you know, the next part of that is when does the statute of limitations start? When does that window begin? On the tenure, on the outside, it's at what the code calls substantial completion. And that can be achieved a variety of ways. Typically, we're going to look at the notice of completion because we can find that pretty readily in the chain of title. Uh, but we've had situations where, you know, you get in there and you don't have access to, say, a certificate of occupancy, uh, a final permit, those are kind of hiding in a building department somewhere, those can actually trigger the statute of, of repose to commence before that notice of completion. So the whole point is don't rely on any singular document, don't feel like you're safe. If you have concerns, you've got to go take care of them. On the shorter statutes of limitations, the code defines the, uh, the triggering event as the close of escrow, which in a common interest development is typically, there are multiple kind of scenarios, but it's typically when the first non-developer director is on the board. But you've probably all seen that scenario. It's one homeowner, three developer-appointed directors. Everything is really chummy. The developers are the best people in the world. They're going to take care of everything. Homeowner, you've got nothing to worry about. We're going to show you how this works. 
all the while the clock is running and, and no one even, is even aware of it. So uh, the point being, if you have concerns, you need to look into them. You need to uh, inform your clients that it's something that at least reach out to legal. We, I mean, Andy, how many kind of free phone calls do you take for 15 minutes and just give someone a little bit of information that gives them what they need to kind of move forward and to just, hey, I've got a basis now, at least I know what I'm looking for. If you have a concern, if you have a thought, if you have a question, reach out. Don't assume that because you heard something at one of these talks that you don't have to worry about it, that more importantly, that your clients don't have to worry about it. Reach out and get some information from people who do this every day. I thought you actually wanted an answer. I was <laughs> well, you took too long. <laughs> and, and your microphone is off, so all right, you lost your chance. So, okay, forget about kind of the standards, forget about statutes of limitations, get to a point where, oh my gosh, we, hit, we have a roof leak and it's, it's pretty bad. Is this a defect? Yes, it's absolutely a defect. Uh, but, you know, if it costs $2,000 to go out there and you fix it and you've got 100 units, you're talking about $20 a door, who cares? You don't need lawyers for that, right? But if you have multiple leaks and now the sidewalk is cracking and there are these other issues and in the aggregate, you're actually really dealing with something, that is when it's time to reach out for help, okay? We're not talking about one isolated issue. We're talking about a pattern or we're talking about a bunch of different problems that are taking place at the same time. And we all know it can be difficult to kind of aggregate all that information, right? Your arms around it. Managers change over all the time. Management companies change over all the time. Boards change over all the time. You may not have kind of ready access to all that information that you need. It just makes it all that more important to kind of move if you have an instinct and, and you think there's a problem. And so, okay, now we've identified there is a problem. We're going to bring the lawyers in. We're going to send what we call a notice to builder. And this is the commencement of the SBA Hunter process. It's not litigation. People want to call it litigation. It's not litigation. You're basically, we send a letter to the developers and we call them on it and we say, hey, here's everything that's wrong with this project. And we are very kind of liberal in our application of that because this notice to builder, it pauses all of the statutes of limitation. It kind of gives you cover. Hey, whatever we captured as of today, bam, we stopped the clock. And whatever rights we had as of today, they are paused, we are good. And so we have to be kind of over-inclusive in that. Um, then what happens is now we have the battle of the experts, right? We bring in kind of the best architects, engineers, specialists, subcontractors, whatever it is, HVAC guys. And, you know, part of the game is, and, and this is part of it, oh my gosh, like, this building is falling down. We're not going to say that in any way that's ever going to make it to the membership. It's all going to be mediation privileged. It's all going to be part of kind of this process because we're forced to do that because the defense is going to come back and say, you know what, duct tape is all you need on this project. You know, we recognize there's something wrong. It's nothing close to what you say. And so you've got kind of like this Cadillac repair that the claimant, the HOA, is calling for. You've got the Ford Pinto that the defense is saying, and you're trying to get to kind of a, to a Toyota Camry in the middle. I know it's a corny analogy, but it's accessible and you get it. And so there's this back and forth. And there are these joint expert meetings. There are, you know, claimant inspections. There are defense inspections. We go back and forth, and hopefully we're kind of wrapping our arms around all the information, and we're getting to a point where we're trying to get to mediation, we're trying to settle this case without getting into litigation, and we're trying to get the association you know, as much money as we can so that over the coming years, they can use this money in, in the ways that are kind of most suitable for the community. The reality is that most communities, we get this money, they don't have to go out and make the repairs right away. And so you get with a construction manager, you get with some people who know, and they say, here are the three things you need to address right now. Let's keep an eye on the rest of it. Because of the building performance standards, there can be a technical violation that we can get money for that you don't actually have to fix right away. And so that's kind of how this all comes together and how it all works. Um, if that fails, now we're going to litigation. Now we're going to arbitration. Now the gloves are off. We're not kind of playing nice anymore. We're not negotiating. Now we're fighting. And, and that process is really going to depend on a variety of things. One, you know, how long it takes. One is going to be the insurance carrier that's involved. Um, two is going to be uh, the law firm that we're dealing with. Three is going to be the complexity of the defects uh, that we are trying to address. And now we're trying to move this as quickly as we can. At the same time, this is kind of the one bite of the apple. So we want to wrap our arms around all of this. And, and usually it ends with some kind of monetary settlement. This law was written 
to allow the builders to come in and actually make the repairs. They have the right to make those repairs. It never ever happens with the big builders for a couple of reasons. One, they, they don't have contractors. They don't have anyone that swings a hammer. The big boys, they identify property, they get the entitlements, it's an investment, they hire a general contractor, the general contractor subs everything out, and whoever it is, they're on to the next project. The things get built, and baked into the price of that project, baked into the price of every unit that was purchased out there is an insurance policy for this exact scenario. So they go through their self-insured retention, and they're out of there. They have no incentive to make any repairs. We've already paid for an insurance policy. Lawyers, go access the insurance policy. Don't call us again. That's just the reality of it. And it's kind of like a dirty secret that we tell these homeowners, you've already paid for this insurance policy. Go access it now. And that's, I think that's it for me. <laughs> All right. I'm going to do this. this. Okay. So the next slide in there is what's the management company's role in the process? And uh, we have heard in a while and acknowledge the fact that sometimes management companies are put in a rough spot because on one hand they get this new property from the developer and they have certain parts of your, your management companies that go out and actively solicit these new projects to work on them. And then you get it turned over to the homeowner board and the homeowner board thinks that everything that the developer did was evil and you want to maintain that relationship but you also want to maintain the relationship with the current homeowner board so you stay on to, to manage the property. Best thing I can tell you on that is to be the most neutral, credible person and call balls and strikes as best you can both ways and as equitably fair as you can because you want to continue to get the next project but you also don't want to lose this one you know, the next day. So um, <clears throat> it also comes down to the next thing that I, you know, those of you that manage new projects, especially recently in the last 10 years, what, remember that, you know that maintenance manual that comes with these projects? And then how are you supposed to comply with this maintenance manual that calls for like quarterly full inspections of the whole property and they don't budget for any of that, right? So, one hand, you're happy you just got this new toll project or this new KV project, but they just put like a sixty to seventy thousand dollar inspection own, you know, requirement onto your project with zero money to do it. So I don't know if you guys use you know third party inspectors or how you guys do it because some of those third party inspection companies are pretty good. They come in, they'll sit down with your maintenance manual and the manager, and they'll say, hey. Let's lay this out in, in you know, the matrix, like an inspection thing that they want that, that you can handle a budget for. You know, I mean, some of them you just can't do. If you don't have the money for it, you're not going to specially assess to inspect your buildings, right? So that's one thing. Also, a couple of these other um, uh, large management companies have um, building engineers. Building engineers can really help this construction defect process because they have got like, literally boots on the ground, they got a lot of information about it, and, and quite recently we've been dealing with a lot of cases that have come in, and the building engineers have been just really great about, you know, really bringing us into the process, but also, you know, keeping the process going um, the right way. Also, with the managers, they, you know, you don't want to go out and just go jump on the attorney and have them there, but it's not a bad thing to go out and get like a third party if you find problems, get a third party uh, expert, like an architect or, or a general contractor that the HOA is used to working with, just to come out and try to be a third party you know, person with the developer. And there's some of these folks out there that have a good relationship with the developers, and you can actually kind of broker some sort of a deal without having to get the attorneys immediately involved. Don't think I don't want you to call us because I got three kids I still got to put through college. But um, I'm understanding that that's the role. You also don't want to make the, uh, the you know, toll or KD or whoever looked like you guys were shredding out and, and, and copping a, a lawyer on it. Um, let's see. Burning Law also has, like a, a Zimmerman um, mentioned it, if it's an early case, like if you got a two, three year project that comes in, it's not really ready to have a construction defect case brought because the, the damage is really haven't manifested, things like that. Burning Law has like a concierge project, a program that we can help monitor the project over time. And that's been really great recently because you know we can send an expert out in, in year three. They can you know you know monitor things, take pictures, 
hold off because we have head up against any real main statute of limitations or repose for that project, and then come out over the next two or three years and really see how that building changes and how it continues to perform or not perform. So that's a big deal. Also, if you have, I know uh, um, Ehrlich and <clears throat> Kennedy are going to be talking about the, the balcony bill inspection coming out of the, the SB 326, but if you have a project that's under the 10-year and it does have inspectable uh, elevated you know, balconies, walkways, stairwells, whatever it might be, it's a great way to collapse that end of the construction defect case because almost always if there's a defect with the building, it's going to be those items. Um, next slide. I should have brought some water up here. Um, factors whether, the, whether the, 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 um, the effect dispute can be resolved in the SB 800 process. Um, the easy one is that, that if there's just a disagreement with the, the defects, right? If you have a, um, you know, like a, a developer that says, I, got, I know you got two leaking windows of a 100 unit per, is that for me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So much better, thank you. I'm also just recently survived COVID, so that's, uh, appreciate that. that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's been, it was, uh, I didn't even know I had it. It's just my daughter tested and I had the test and I got it. So, um, so the, the other thing that we, uh, and Silver mentioned it, is all of these developers have uh, what's called a self-insured insured retention program on their insurance policies. Some of them might be as low as $50,000. It's almost like a deductible for your car. So like what's your deductible of your car? Like 500, 1,000 bucks, something like that. So you got a couple scratches on your car, you're gonna turn that in as a claim? No, you're just gonna fix it yourself. Well, there's some of these developers that have self-insured retention programs that are like two million or five million. And you know, it might be a $20 million claim or a $20 million policy, but they got $5 million that they have to satisfy before their insurance drops down. And if you got a $3 million claim, they're going to say, hey, I'm going to pay for that out of my own pocket because i got to pay for it anyway. So that's sometimes that they, they can resolve earlier. Um, another thing that can affect it is, is the developer's not going to pay one dime of its money or insurance money for a claim unless it gets a complete release from the claim. Because as they say, the HOA um, only has really one desirable thing for the developer and the insurance company, and that's a release for their claim, right? So they're going to be pushing for that full release, but you may have some smaller items in year two and three that, that you want to take care of, but the items six, seven, eight years old that you don't know about yet haven't hit. That's why everyone was talking about if you're going to go after it, you go after it big. Um, let's see. Other issues are if there's a product issue with a, with a case, product supplier, product manufacturers will not, they do not, um, uh, usually negotiate the settlement because then they have to admit that their products got some sort of a defect to it. So they're always going to want to litigate those. But those same products almost always have a warranty. And that warranty not only goes to you as the HOA, but also to the developer. And it's sometimes a good way to team up with the developer if it's a big you know, warranty type item. The developer will be your, your ally, not your, your opponent in the case. So that's something else to think about. And there's also attorney's fee agreements that can uh, be an, uh, an issue when you're trying to settle a case early. For example, let's say you are in the SB 800 process and you have signed a 30% or a 33% contingency fee with a law firm, and that law firm, or excuse me, the, the developer turns around and says, I'm going to make the repairs. Well, usually that law firm is going to go, well, I want 30% of the value of what that repair is, right? So that would be a hard way to be able to HOA and have to say, oh, I've got to pay 30%, let's say it's a million dollar repair, I got to pay 30, or $300,000 out of my pocket. Burning a while has a fee agreement that um, actually, I think I'm the one that came up with it, but we're able to revert back from the contingency to an hourly if they make the offer of repair during the SB 800 process. So usually the amount of hours you've spent on the case by the time the, the developer would make the repair is literally like, $70,000 or $60,000. So it's a good deal if the developer makes the repair. I think on that, we are at the end of the, 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 the issue. Slide number seven, which is any questions or comments or anything in general? What are you guys looking for? No your questions. A 15 minute break. Yeah. But he's ready for the bar to open. <laughs> 
on that, if, uh, I think we're uh, we're on break until uh, 1:55.